Good morning, dear friends. Today, our talk will be about a very important part of the central skull base, which is the sphenoid bone and the sphenoid sinus. And we are going to unveil the secrets of the endoscopic anatomy. Many of your colleagues asked me to do this topic because sometimes the endoscopic anatomy is a bit vague in this region. So, the sphenoid bone, this is the sphenoid bone, and it is present in the central part of the base of the skull. And the sphenoid bone, as we said, is butterfly-shaped, having a body, two greater wings, two lesser wings, and two pterygoid processes. The sphenoid body is essentially hollow, containing the sphenoid sinus. So the sphenoid bone is a body, two greater wings, two lesser wings, and two pterygoid processes, like a butterfly. And the sphenoid bone articulates anteriorly with the ethmoid bone. You all know the ethmoid is in front of the sphenoid, and posteriorly it articulates with the basi occiput. Uh, the clivus is formed by the union of the basi occiput with the basi sphenoid. So articulating anteriorly with the ethmoid, posteriorly with the uh, occipital bone, the basi occiput. Laterally, it is articulating with the temporal bone and with the zygomatic bone. And anterolaterally, the lesser wings articulate with the orbital plate of the frontal bone, as we'll see in a few minutes. And the sphenoid body has a roof forming the planum sphenoidal, the sulcus chiasmaticus from anterior to posterior. Planum sphenoidal, sulcus chiasmaticus, tuberculum cellae, the cella, the dorsum cellae, and the upper clivus. So this is the sphenoid bone, as we said. And we said it is articulating anteriorly with the ethmoid bone and posteriorly with the basi occiput and laterally articulating with the temporal bone. Also laterally it is articulating with the zygomatic bone. <clears throat> and you see that the roof is formed of the planum sphenoidal, the sulcus chiasmaticus, tuberculum cellae, cella trisica, dorsum cellae. This is an anterior view of the sphenoid bone. It looks like a butterfly and it has a body. The body has two openings to the body which are called the sphenoid ostium. And it has two lesser wings and two greater wings and the pterygoid processes. From this we see that there is a medial and the lateral pterygoid process. And from this we see that there is a space between the lesser wing and the greater wing, which is the superior orbital fissure, uh, uh, carrying structures from the cavernous sinus to the orbit. Another time you see that this region or this bone is containing some foramina, which are the foramen rotundum, the foramen oval, and foramen spinosa. Foramen rotundum is present in the medial part of the sphenoid bone and the foramen oval and the foramen spinosum in the base of the sphenoid bone. This is a view from above. Again, we can see from anterior to posterior the roof, the planum sphenoidal, the sulcus chiasmaticus, the tuberculum cellae, and the most lateral part of the tuberculum cellae is the middle clinoid. Then the cella trusica, then the dorsum cellae, then an upper part of the clivus. Also, the lesser wing of the sphenoid uh, continues medially as the anterior clinoid process, which is lateral to the optic canal, lateral to the optic nerve, and lateral to the carotid artery, as we'll see right now, and the base of the middle fossa contains the foramen rotundum, medially, foramen oval, foramen spinosum, posteriorly. So these foramina are all present in the sphenoid bone. Also we can see a part between the greater wing of the sphenoid and the lesser wing, which is the superior orbital fissure. So 
optic canal, superorbital fissure, foramen rotundum, foramen oval, and foramen spinosum. This is a view from below. You don't see the foramen rotundum here because it's present medially. You see the foramen oval and foramen spinosa. You see the pterygoids, the medial pterygoid process, and the lateral pterygoid process. And the part, the, this part of the, at the end of the medial pterygoid is called the pterygoid hamulus. And you see that it is articulating laterally with the temporal bone and the zygomatic bone, as we'll see. And the sphenoid bone, I will talk about more about the sphenoid bone. We are not discussing uh, the sphenoid sinus yet, we are discussing the sphenoid bone. The greater wings of the sphenoid form the lateral wall of the orbit, articulating with the zygomatic bone, as we said, and the temporal bone, and forms the lower border of the superior orbital fissure. The greater wings also form the medial part of the middle cranial fossa, so the middle cranial fossa has a medial part formed of the sphenoid and a lateral part formed of the temple. The medial part, which is of the middle cranial fossa, contains the foramen rotundum, the foramen oval, and foramen spinosum, and the lesser wings form the posterior part of the orbital roof, articulating with the orbital plate of the frontal bone, as we'll see, and forming the upper border of the superior orbital fissure. <coughs> so the lower border of the superior orbital fissure is formed by the greater wing, upper border is formed by the lesser wing. The lesser wing form the anterior clinoid. When the lesser wings continue medially, they form the anterior clinoid process, forming the lateral wall of the optic canal, where the medial wall of the optic canal is formed by the body of the sphenoid. And also it is lateral to the clinoidal carotid artery. If you remember from the anatomy of the carotid, so what is medial to the anterior clinoid is the optic nerve and the clinoidal carotid artery, and <clears throat> the lateral wall of the optic canal is formed of the anterior clinoid, but the medial wall is formed also by the body of the sphenoid. The pterygoid processes are medial, the medial pterygoid process forming the lateral boundary of the coena. What is the coena? It is the posterior nasal opening, as we'll see, and the lateral pterygoid process gives origin to the pterygoid muscles, medial and lateral pterygoid muscles from the medial and lateral surfaces of the lateral pterygoid process. This is another view <coughs> from above again, and in more detailed view showing the body of the sphenoid articulating anteriorly with the ethmoid bone, posteriorly with the basis sphenoid, laterally with the temporal bone, and having the lesser wing articulating with the orbital plate of the frontal bone and forming medially the anterior clinoid, which is lateral boundary of the optic canal and the lateral boundary of the uh, clinoidal carotid artery. And as we said, the medial wall of the optic canal is made by the body of the sphenoid and uh, the also the greater wing of the sphenoid <coughs> is forming the lateral wall of the orbit, articulating with the zygomatic bone, and there is a fissure between the lesser wing and the greater wing, which is the superior orbital fissure, and the medial part of the greater wing of the sphenoid is containing foramina, one, uh, the medial wall of the greater wing, which is the foramen rotundum, and two in the floor or of the greater wing, which are the foramen oval, and for him and spinosum. What is inviolate here is the temporal bone. This is a sphenoid bone totally taken out from the articulation, and as we said, we can say it together, the planum, then the sulcus chiasmaticus, then the tuberculum cellae, the most lateral part is the middle clinoid, then the floor of the cella, then the dorsum cellae, and as we said, on either side, there is also the cavernous sinus on either side of the cella turcica in, uh, on the uh, uh, lateral to the body of the sphenoid bone. And this is the greater wing of the sphenoid. Sorry, this is the greater wing of the sphenoid. This is the lesser wing, the superior orbital fissure. This is the foramen rotundum. This is the foramen oval.
and the foramen spinosum, and we can here see the pterygoid processes, the medial and lateral pterygoid processes. And another view from below, pterygoid processes are seen here, and it is seen forming the medial part of the middle cranial fossa, and here we see oval and spinosum. And this is an orbital view. If you look to the orbit from front and you remove the orbital content, you can see that the lesser ring of the sphenoid is here and the optic canal is here and the greater ring of the sphenoid forming the lateral wall of the orbit, as we said, and it is articulating with the zygomatic bone, as we said, and the space between the lesser ring and greater ring forming the superior orbital fissure also, the space between the greater wing and the maxillary bone forming the inferior orbital fissure. So, our concern about the sphenoid bone here. Again, lesser wing of the sphenoid, greater wing of the sphenoid, superior orbital fissure, optic canal, and articulation between the greater wing of the sphenoid and the zygomatic bone here. Sphenoid sinus, as we said, the sphenoid sinus is the hollow, the sphenoid bone has a hollow body, and this space is called the sphenoid sinus. The sphenoid sinuses are paired, so we have two sphenoid sinuses within the body of the sphenoid bone, communicating <coughs> with the roof of the nasal cavity via an opening called the sphenoid ostium. The sphenoid ostium opens where? It opens in the sphenoid is moidal recess. Above the, uh, or medial to the superior terminate, there is a cold part called the sphenoid moidal recess, and this is where the sphenoid ostium, the opening of the sphenoid opens. The sphenoid sinuses vary in shape and size according to the number, shape and size of the intervening septa. So inside the sphenoid sinus, we have bony septa that divide the sphenoid sinus and change the shape of the sphenoid sinus from one patient to the other, and we will discuss it in detail, and these are very important in transphenoidal surgery. And uh, last but not least, the sphenoid sinus is poorly pneumatized in childhood and reaches its full size in adulthood. So when you are going to operate on a child and going through, through the transphenoidal route, you have to have an image because you will not enter a sinus, you will work in bone reaching the cella because the sphenoid sinus is normally not pneumatized or poorly pneumatized in children. Uh, this is the view of the sphenoid sinus, lateral view. This is the roof of the sphenoid sinus, posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus floor. This is the ostium. Where, where is the ostium? It is in the sphenoid modalitis, medial to the superior turbinate, superior conch or superior turbinate. <clears throat> Another view, in the lateral view, showing the nose, this is the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, and the superior turbinate. Medial to the superior turbinate, we find the sphenoid ostium. The ostium of the sphenoid sinus is not in the dependent part, but it is in the upper part of the sinus. This is a radiography, plain X-ray showing this is the floor of the anterior fossa, this is the anterior clinoid, the floor of the cella, dorsum cellae, and here is the sphenoid sinus, this air present here, all this air is the, the sphenoid sinus. Of course, this is in front of it, it's more, this is the maxillary sinus. So, this is the sphenoid sinus. Be appearing in plain X-ray, hypodense because of the air inside the sinus. And this is an endoscopic view. It's very important. This is the nasal septum, and we are looking from the left side. This is lateral, and this is medial. This is the middle meatus with the endoscope. And as we said, this is the superior turbinate, and the superior conchi. And we find the sphenoid ostia medial to the superior turbinate, <clears throat> and this is the nasal septum. You can imagine the patient is in front of me, the left side, 
medial, lateral, superior turbinate, and an opening medial to the superior turbinate, the upper part of the sphenoid sinus, which is the sphenoid ostium. Another view from the other side, this is from the right side of the patient. This is the nasal septum. This is medial, and this is lateral. This is the middle turbinate. This is the superior turbinate, and you find that the sphenoid ostium is present in the upper part of the sphenoid sinus, medial to the superior turbinate. And this is to show you the sinus from inside. As we said, there is septae inside the sinus, causing variation in the shape of the different sinuses, but generally speaking, they are two sphenoid sinuses. In this case, you find the single septum, and the single septum <coughs> is almost in the midline, or slightly to the right. This is another coronal section. You find here the cavernous sinus, you find here the right and left sinoid sinuses, but you find that there is a single septum not pointing to the midline, but pointing to the cavernous sinus, pointing to the carotid, and it is a common finding. And this is a coronal section. It's very important to do a coronal CT in every case of transphenoidal surgery, whether endoscopic or microscopic. Why? To identify the midline. So in this case, we know that the sinus is passing to the right cavernous sinus, so the midline is to the left of this sinus. This sinus is strictly in the midline, so the midline is where is the sinus. This sinus is doing two branches, so we have to identify the midline in relation to this, and here they have uh, four divisions of the sinus, dividing the sinus into four spaces, could happen, and you identify with the vertical space, the midline is almost here. So in every case of transphenoidal surgery, you have to do a coronal CT. The MRI is not enough because it doesn't uh, show in detail the bone. And this is the skull of a child, and you see this is the cella, and all this is the clivus. There is no sphenoid sinus. It is not pneumatized. You can see that this is like the conchal type or less, and you are going to, to reach the cella in a child transphenoidally. You have to drill the bone guided by an image or CT guided or navigator or whatever you want to reach properly the floor of the cell because the anatomy is disturbed. All here is bone. Another way showing the how do we reach the sphenoid sinus and how can we reach the cella from the transphenoidal root. And we open the floor, the face of the sinus, and we reach the uh, upper part of the posterior wall of the sinus where you can find the cella and find the clivus, can find the planum, as we'll see. The sphenoid sinus, according to pneumatization, the sphenoid sinus is divided into three types. So there are three main types, the cellar, the precellar, and the conchal. Uh, the cellar could be present in 85% of the cases. The precellar could be present in 12% of the cases, and the conchal in 3% of the cases. As we said, the sphenoid ostium is often medial and posterior to the superior turbinate. So, when you reach the cavity of the nose, you look to the superior turbinate and you look medial and posterior to the superior turbinate, you find the sphenoid ostium. And to open the sphenoid sinus, we have to remove the posterior part of the vomer, which looks like the keel of a boat at the face of the sphenoid. So, in front, at the middle of the sphenoid sinus anteriorly, there is a bone called the vomer which is forming the posterior part of the nasal septum, and it has a keel like the keel of the boat. When you remove this keel, you open the sphenoid face. So these are the types of sinuses, conchal, the precellar, and the cellar. Less common, 3%, could be. It varies from one series to the other, but mostly 3%. This one is 12%. This is 12%. 
85%. Concal, pre-cellular, because it's in front of the cella, and cellular, because it is surrounding the cella totally. Another view, I'm showing the radiology, the concal type. It appears hypo-intense. This is the bone window, CT, sagittal. And this is the pre-cellular type. This is the cella, and this is the sinus. This is the cellular type. This is the cella, and here is the sinus at the anterior wall of the cella, at the floor of the cella. And this is hyper-pneumatized sinus. Even pneumatization is reaching the clivus, as you see. But this is very uncommon. These are the three common types. Concal, pre-cellular, and cellular. If you look from below through the nasal cavity, we have to unveil the secrets of the endoscopic anatomy, as we said. We are on the right side. This is medial, and this is lateral. This is the superior turbinate, and this is the middle turbinate. Above the, superior turb above the middle turbinate, we find a very important artery here. It's called the sphenopalatine artery. It passes from the sphenopalatine foramen at the sphenopalatine ganglion, and then it forms an artery <coughs> crossing transversely from lateral to medial, and it's called the posterior septal artery. Why? Because it is supplying the posterior part of the nasal septum. This artery uh, could be injured during surgery in opening the sphenoid face, the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, but it's not a big deal. You can coagulate it easily. And it is anastomosing with the posterior ethmoidal arteries. So the blood supply of this region, the sphenopalatine artery from the sphenopalatine foramen above the middle turbinate, dividing into giving two branches, the posterior septal artery crossing from lateral to medial, uh, nourishing the posterior part of the nasal septum. And there is another branch which is called the posterior lateral nasal opening uh, artery, posterior lateral nasal artery on the surface of the superior turbinate. So the sphenopalatine artery divides into the posterior septal artery and divides into the posterior lateral nasal artery. Why posterior? Because you are posterior. Why lateral? Because here is medial. Nasal because they are in the nose. So it is supplying the posterior part of the lateral nose called posterior lateral nasal artery. And this is called the posterior septal artery. And they anastomose with the posterior ethmoidal arteries, as you remember, branches of the ophthalmic, anterior posterior ethmoidal arteries, supplying this region. This is also important to preserve if you're going to do what we call the nasoseptal flap or habdat flap, you keep it vascularized. This is after removing the bone, and we see that we have the right and left uh, sphenoid ostia, and this is the rostrum, as we said, and it is articulating with the vomer. The vomer here is fractured and laxated and displaced laterally. So the vomer was here. The vomer is the posterior part of the nasal septum. You have to break the vomer to reach the rostrum of the sinus and to open the sinus. Sometimes you can open the sinus from the sphenoid ostium if you found it, but you have to go down to remove all the sphenoid face to be able to see all the structures inside the sphenoid sinus very clearly. And this is the superior turbinate, and as we said, it is medial and posterior to the superior turbinate, the ostium. And anteriorly, there is the ethmoid. Borders of the sphenoid sinus, anteriorly we have the superior turbinate and posterior ethmoidal cells. As we said, that anterior to the sphenoid bone, we have the ethmoidal bone. So anterior to the sphenoid sinus, we have posterior ethmoidal and the superior turbinate. Posteriorly, we have the cellular floor superiorly and the clivus inferiorly. So this is anteriorly, posteriorly. 
and superiorly we have the planum sphenoidal and the anterior skull base. So the roof of the sphenoid sinus is the planum sphenoidal anterior skull base. The posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus above is the cella, below is the clivus. Anterior wall is the superior turbinate and ethmoidal cells. And medially, of course, there is the intersinus septic. We have two separate sinuses. The medial wall of the sphenoid is the septum, where it is single or multiple. And laterally, in the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus, we find the optic nerve and the optic canal, we find the cavernous sinus, and we find the infratemporal fossa. As we'll see it right now, this is the sphenoid face, and we move the, this is a septum, and the septum is pointing to the carotid prominence on one side, and we try to remove the mucosa, and we try to, not too much mucosa to remove, but remove the bone from the ostium. This was seen before. And after removing the sphenoid face, after removing, opening this bone, all this bone, all the sphenoid face, all the anterior wall of the sphenoid, removing the vomer and the rostrum of the sphenoid sinus, you will find this view looking to the roof of the sphenoid sinus, which is made by the planum sphenoidal, looking to the posterior wall of the sphenoid sinus, which is the cellular floor and the clivus, and looking laterally, where is the optic nerve and the cavernous sinus and carotid prominences, and more laterally, the infratemporal fossa. Again, if you go from, now we are talking about the endoscopic anatomy, I'm going to unveil the secrets of the endoscopic anatomy. This is the planum sphenoidal here, and we have the sulcus chiasmaticus. So here we have the sulcus prominence, the optic prominence. What it, what it is sulcus from above is a prominence from below. What it is uh, sulcus from below is a prominence from above. So when you are looking below, we see the planum sphenoidal, it is at the same, but we have the sulcus chiasmaticus or the optic uh, sulcus. Here you have the optic prominence. And you have the, after that, the tuberculum cell. Here you have the tuberculum recess because it is a bone above. Now here it is a recess inside the bone. And then you find the floor of the cella, and then you find the clivus. And laterally, as we said, you find the optic nerve, you find the carotid in the cavernous sinus, and you find more lateral to it, the middle fossa and the gasserian ganglion. So this is without illustration. You see here, this is the planum sphenoidal, and you find this is the chiasmatic prominence, the optic prominence, and then you find the tubercular recess, this is the optic prominence, this is the tuberculum recess, remember the tuberculum cell, and this is the floor of the cell, and laterally optic nerve, cavernous carotid artery, and middle fossa. Again, don't worry, it's very easy. We are going to repeat it several times and you're going to learn it by heart, I assure you. So again, we are going from below and we took all the sphenoid face and we found here that this is the planum sphenoidal and after the planum we have the prominence, planum sphenoidal here. This is the optic prominence, bulge, opposing the optic uh, sulcus, the sulcus chiasmaticus. So this is the chiasmatic prominence. And then recess, tuberculum cellae. Here it is called the tuberculum recess. And then the floor of the cella. And then the clivus. And then the carotid prominence here and here. 
and you will find that between the optic nerve and the carotid, in most of the cases, especially in fresh cases, there is a recess called the optico carotid recess. Very easy. This is the optic nerve. This is the carotid. And between the optic nerve and the carotid, it's the optico carotid recess. Actually, it is the lateral optico carotid recess, which is very well formed. There is also what we call the medial optico carotid recess, which is not well formed as the lateral optico carotid recess. So let's say one thing now, and we will assure it or we'll confirm it later on. The, the lateral optic carotid recess is inside the cavity of the anterior climber. The medial optic carotid recess is inside the cavity of the middle clinoid. What is the middle clinoid? The most lateral part of the tuberculum cell. So this is the tuberculum sulcus, and this is the medial optico carotid recess. Gradually, you will catch it, no problem. Also here, you can see the carotid going here. This is the paraclival carotid artery. You can see here is the clivus, lateral to the clivus, lateral to the upper third of the clivus. We have the clival carotid artery, which is a part of the lateral carotid artery. If you remember the lateral segment of the carotid coming above the foramen lateral from the petrous bone, lateral to the clivus, hugging the upper third of the clivus. So the upper third of the clivus, the carotid, is just lateral to the clivus. Lower two thirds, it's a bit far, as we'll see now. Here is the clivus. Here is the paraclival carotid. Here is the cavernous carotid. This is the medial loop of the carotid convex posteriorly. And this is horizontal part. This is the anterior loop convex anteriorly. So this is the cavernous carotid. But when you go anteriorly, Medial to the optic carotid recess, this carotid is called the clinoidal segment of the carotid. So, lateral segment or paraclival segment of the carotid, cavernous segment of the carotid, and the clinoidal segment of the carotid, as we'll see it. Again, Branham Sunidal, uh, charismatic prominence, tuberculum sulcus. Floor of the cella, clivus, paraclival or lateral carotid, internal carotid artery inside the sinus. The, this is the right optic nerve, the left optic nerve, and there is a recess between the carotid and the optic nerve, which is lateral optic carotid recess, and it is in the cavity of the anterior clinoid. And this is the medial optic carotid recess in the cavity of the middle clinoid. And the carotid here is passing lateral to the clivus, upper third, passing in the cavernous sinus, then coming out medial to the optic carotid recess, forming the clinoidal carotid artery, having two rings, as we'll see. So again, this is a, a real cadaveric view. Floor of the cell, right, uh, the left optic nerve, right optic nerve, optic carotid recess, the lateral wall containing the cavernous carotid artery, the other one, cavernous carotid artery, lateral to the cella tersica, coming from the lateral to the clivus, lateral part, but here we did not remove all the sphenoid face, it's not that clear. And again, planum, chiasmatic prominence, and the uh, uh, tuberculum sulcus. Sphenoid sinus is a very important corridor to the cellular, supracellular, cavernous, and clival tumors. So all these regions can be reached from the sphenoid sinus. You can do a surgery for the cellular region, supracellular region, cavernous sinus, clival tumors, even middle fossa tumors, and gasserian ganglion for the endoscopic transphenoidal and extended transphenoidal approach. So we have the endoscopic 
plastic transfinoidal and the extended transfinoid. Secrets of applied endoscopic transfinoidal anatomy. To reach the sphenoid sinus, as we said endoscopically, you have to open it. Where to open the sinus? From the ostium. Where is the ostium, as we said? Medial to the superior turbulent or the superior conch. So this is the first secret to open the sphenoid sinus after identifying the sphenoid ostium, medial and posterior to the superior turbulent. If you are not able to identify the ostium, cases after sinusitis, cases recurrent, you open the sinus one and a half centimeter below the posterior border of the superior turbulent. Many, many neurosurgeons, when they work with ENT surgeons, they want to localize how can we open the sphenoid sinus safely? Even if you don't see the sphenoid ostium, you can go, if you don't see the ostium, to the posterior border of the superior turbinate, and you go below it, and you open. Or two centimeters above the kuani, posterior nasal opening. So it reaches the same point. So if you want to identify the ostium and open from the ostium, this is the best to remove the anterior wall of the sphenoid. If you are not able to reach the ostium, for whatever reason, you go one and a half centimeters below, below what? The posterior border of the superior turbulent, not below the superior turbulent, below the posterior border of the superior turbulent, as we said, it is medial and posterior to the superior turbulent. Or you go two centimeters above the kuani, which is the posterior nasal opening. We'll see it right now. Don't worry. And you have to have a preoperative CT coronal and axial cuts to identify the topography of the sinuses, to identify the midline inside the sinus, as we said. And in recurrent and complex cases, you can identify the midline roughly by the nasal septum. Sometimes the cold, all the septa inside the sinus are removed. So to identify the midline, whether by navigation or you can make use of the nasal septum. So these are the first secrets, how to reach the ostium, how, if you don't find the ostium, you are not sure this is the ostium, how to open the sphenoid face, how to open the anterior of the sphenoid, two ways. And also one of the secrets you have to do, a preoperative CT, as we said, coronal cuts or axial cuts to identify the septa inside the sinus. And in complex cases, you have to make use of the nasal septum, nasal septum to identify the midline. So this is a view of the right part. We're going endoscopically. This is median. This is the nasal septum. And you find here the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, superior turbinate. And this is the, fl the floor of the superior turbinate. This is the posterior wall of superior turbinate. Below the posterior wall, you find the sphenoid ostium. And here, if you remember the blood supply, and we said the posterior nasal artery passing here, you preserve this artery if you are going to do a flap. What is the flap? It's called the haddad flap or the nasoceptal flap to uh, use it in cases of extended transphenoidal approach for the repair of the floor of the uh, cell. So when you're doing extended transphenoidal, especially in cranial pharyngiomas, where there is a very high flow of CSF, where the third ventricle opens into the floor of the cell, you have to make use of this vascularized flap. And the flap, you take it from the nasal septum, and you preserve the blood supply of the flap, and you put it on one side till the end of surgery, and you use it for the repair. Being vascularized, it is of very important uh, uh, way to heal. Another septum, we are right side, superior turbinate, medial to the superior wall of the superior turbinate, superior ostium, and you open this ostium to, re to reach the sphenoid face. And this is the kuani, kuani with the posterior nasal opening. What, from what is made, it's made medially by the nasal septum, inferiorly by the greater palatine, well, the, the palatine bone, and laterally by the medial pterygoid plate. If you look with the endoscope, inferiorly, you will find this opening. Medially, 
the septum, nasal septum, inferiorly, palatine bone, laterally, the medial pterygoid bone. If you go above this opening by two centimeters, you reach the sphenoid face. If you go above this opening by two centimeters, you reach the face of the sphenoid bone. So this is another way to identify the sphenoid face. And here is the Kuani here. And you go with the endoscope this way. You identify the posterior nasal opening between the palatine bone, between the nasal septum, between the pterygoid. And you go from the Kuani, from this opening, two centimeters above the opening, and you reach, this is the Kuani, and two centimeters above, reach the sphenoid face. So whether you go below the posterior border of the superior turbinate, for one and a half centimeter, or you go above the Kuani by two centimeters and you reach the face of the sphenoid. This is a very important secret. And here is another view. This is the nasal septum. This is the right side. This is lateral. And this is the superior turbinate. And this is the posterior border of the superior turbinate. If you go one and a half centimeters below, posterior border of superior turbinate, you reach the sphenoid face if you don't see the ostium. The secrets also include two important structures. Actually, why we are doing all this, why we are studying all this anatomy? Because we have two important structures to preserve inside the sphenoid sinus, which are the internal carotid artery and the optic nerve. So as neurosurgeons, you should not know every part of the anatomy of the sinuses, like the bullus ismoidalis, the hiatus semilunaris, the fossa incudis, the onodi cells, and many, many, many talks. You have to know where is the internal carotid and where is the optic nerve to stay safe. If you know where these two important structures are, you don't need to know all the anatomy of the ostia because this is not really our work. And we another secret, so we, we have to preserve two structures. We have to know the anatomy of two structures. Tonal carotid, optic nerve, and the lateral segment of the carotid comes from lateral to medial, lateral to the mid clivus, below the median canal. So it comes from lateral to medial and median nerve. This is a very important nerve. We'll talk about it in detail now. It is formed by the union of the deep petrosal nerve and the greater superficial petrosal. And if you injure the median nerve, you can get a reduction in lacrimation because it supplies the lacrimal gland parasympathetic from the fascia. The lateral segment of the carotid then hugs, as we said, the upper third of the clivus bilaterally above the level of the median canal and the median nerve. So the median nerve is a very important landmark uh, lateral to the clivus. Above it is very dangerous because the carotid is just lateral to the clivus, but below the median nerve, the uh, you can go lateral to the clivus relatively safely because the carotid is, is far from the lower two-thirds of the clivus. So this is another secret to remember. And the lateral carotid, after that, as we said, forms the cavernous carotid inside the cavernous sinus, lateral to the cella torsica, and the cavernous sinus, cavernous carotid, as you remember from the carotid, form the clinoidal carotid, forming the lateral and medial optic carotid recesses between the two rings. You remember the distal rings, the proximal and distal distal rings of the carotid. You will see it now. So, these are the segments, and this is, I don't like this uh, anatomy C1, C2, C3, it explains nothing, but this is the course of the carotid artery, this is the petrous carotid, this is the posterior loop, and this is 
the lateral loop and this is the medial loop and this is the anterior loop again this is the petrous carotid this is the lateral carotid part of it is the paraclival carotid this is the cavernous carotid this is the clinoidal carotid and this is of course you don't see it here the internal uh, intracranial carotid again as we see the carotid comes laterally from lateral to media this is the lateral segment this is the foramen lateral it doesn't pass through the foramen lateral but it is above it so it comes from lateral to media and so we have here the remember the sphenolingual recesses or petrosphenoidal recesses and then the it hugs the upper third of the clivus and here is the median nerve should be here what is above is dangerous what is below the carotid is a bit lateral and then the paraclival carotid artery passes lateral to the cella forming the paracellular carotid which is inside the cavernous sinus then we pass forming the clinoidal carotid artery which is medial to the anterior clinoid and then intracranial here we remove the dura and you find the ophthalmic branch under the optic nerve i know it's a bit perplexing but try to imagine with me all you should know here is that petrous carotid goes from lateral to media and it is just lateral hugging the clivus upper third and then continues here is the uh, posterior loop here is the lateral loop which is medial to the gasserian ganglion and here is the vidian nerve you see the vidian nerve here is the vidian nerve and the vidian nerve as i told you above the vidian nerve the carotid is immediately lateral to the clivus below the median nerve the carotid is a bit far lateral from the clivus you see so if you have a structure in the clivus involving the lower two thirds you are relatively safe involving the clivus below the median nerve below the median canal you are relatively safe above the median canal or at the median canal it's very dangerous if you go a bit lateral to the clivus you'll find the carotid here and this is the actual view we see when you open again the planus phenodial the optic nerve the optic prominence the tuberculum uh, sulcus and the uh, medial optic carotid recess lateral optic carotid recess the optic nerve and the clinoidal carotid and this is the cavernous carotid this is the paraclival carotid and this is paraclival carotid and here is the clivus and of course this is the floor of the cell so we identify first the floor of the cell what is lateral to it is the cavernous carotid what is continuing medial to the optic carotid recess is the clinoidal carotid uh, what is anterior to the optic carotid recess is the optic nerve and what is posterior to the cella is the clivus what is lateral to the clivus upper third is the paraclival carotid or the lateral segment of the internal carotid artery coming from the petrous bone on its way to the cavernous sinus this is another detailed view you find here the cella as we said then you go anteriorly we have the structures we said posterior you have the clivus and the clivus upper third of the clivus you have the carotid on either side and if you open the clivus you find the basilar plexus and the basilar dura and then the brain stem uh, what i want to show you here is the paraclival carotid what is lateral to the paraclival carotid is the gasserian ganglion and v1 and v2 of the trigemin so you can reach also the trigeminal region from below 
In this case, you have to have a Doppler. Real-time identification of the carotid artery is the best. If you don't have it, you can use the navigator. And, of course, if you remove all the bone, you will find the basilar artery and the brain stem. The pons is here, and the carotids are here. And, as we said, the clival carotid form the cavernous carotid, form the clinoidal carotid, and what is medial to the clinoid in the medial optic carotid recess is the clinoidal carotid. Here is the proximal ring, and here is the distal ring before going intracranially. We are showing more here, as we said, when you have the clivus, upper third of the clivus, lateral to it, carotid prominence, clival carotid, paraclival carotid, very dangerous. If you identify it and go lateral to it, you will find the Gasserian ganglion. So this is another secret. Where can you find the Gasserian ganglion from below? And lateral to it, of course, here, you can find the floor of the middle fossa, and here you find the floor of the orbit. We'll see it now. This is the base for the extended transphenoidal approach, as we'll see. More secrets. The lateral optic carotid recess, as we said, is inside the anterior clinoid. The medial optic carotid recess is less developed as it's inside the middle clinoid, as we said. The bone between the two recesses is the optic strut. Actually, it's not between the two recesses. It is on the undersurface of the optic nerve. It's called the optic strut. You remove this bone, you can expose the optic canal transphenoidal. The part of the internal carotid artery, medial to the lateral opticocarotid recess, and lateral to the prominence chiasmaticus, as we said, is the clinoidal carotid artery, which is extracranial between the proximal and distal dual rings. Extracranial? Yes, if you remember the carotid. Don't worry, we are going to uh, re-explain it now. Don't worry. So the the clinoidal carotid is extra dura. And in transplanum approach, it is of utmost importance to preserve the superior hemophysial artery supplying the optic chasm from below. So, another secret, very important. So, as we said, the secrets, some of our secrets, cavity of the optic, the optic, optic artery cells is inside the anterior clinoid. Medial optic artery cells in the middle clinoid, under surface of the optic uh, nerve is the optic strut. Actually, it's not between the two recesses. Uh, but uh, the part of the internal carotid artery medial to the lateral optic carotid recess is the clinoidal carotid segment of the carotid passing between the proximal and the distal rings. And if you are going to do an extended transphenoidal, removing the bone of the planum, remember always. The superior hypophysial artery, the only medial branch of the internal carotid artery, arising from the carotid immediately after piercing the dura intracranially, it supplies the chiasm from below, and it has to be preserved. Again, the same view, we've seen it before. Paraclival, this is the uh, carotid artery in the neck, and the petrous carotid, posterior loop, and then lateral carotid, and this is forming the uh, uh, lateral loop, which is medial to the trigeminal, and here is the median nerve. Above the median nerve, at the upper third of the clivus, hugging the clivus, below it is a bit lateral, then it continues as the cavernous carotid, then the clinoidal carotid. Paraclival, or lateral carotid, Cavernous carotid, clinoidal carotid, then it passes intracranial. The clinoidal carotid, we have here the proximal ring, and here is the distal ring, then it pierces the dura of the distal ring entering intracranial. Optic nerve, of course, lateral optic carotid recess, medial optic carotid recess, and this is the optic strut. We know it before. Another nice view showing how the carotid behaves <coughs> coming from lateral to medial, paraclival, 
above the vidya nerve. This is the vidya nerve hugging the upper third of the clavius, <coughs> forming <coughs> the <coughs> uh, medial loop, which is convex posteriorly, then the horizontal segment, then the anterior loop, which is convex anteriorly, and uh, the part medial to the opticocarotid recess is the clinoidal part. <coughs> this is the proximal ring. And this is the distal ring. Between the proximal ring and the distal ring lies the clinoidal segment. The clinoidal segment is an extradural segment, comes from the cavernous sinus, and passes extradurally and enters pierces the dura by piercing the distal ring, entering intracranial. Clinoidal segment, cavernous segment, anterior loop convex anteriorly, the medial loop, this is the uh, me me medial loop convex posteriorly. The medial loop is convex posteriorly, if you remember, gives the meningeal and physical trunk, and I am looking from front, so it is posterior to me. So, paraclival or lateral, medial loop, horizontal segment, lateral loop, oh, sorry, uh, anterior loop, convex anteriorly, and medial to the optic carotid recess is the below proximal ring, above distal ring, and this is the clinoidal carotid. Again, this is the paraclival carotid. This is the medial loop convex posteriorly. This is the horizontal segment in the cavernous sinus. All this is lateral to the cella thoracica. And then passes medial to the optic carotid recess. Here we have, this is the optic nerve. This is the carotid, this is the optic carotid recess. Medial to it, there is a ring here, which is the proximal ring. And there is a ring there, distal ring. Sorry, you have a problem with the power. I'll try to solve this problem. Yeah, now it's fixed. I'm sorry. And then we are going to continue. I'm repeating this several times because it is not easy to imagine it. That's why we are going to repeat it several times. And as we said, the paraclival carotid coming from lateral to medial, hugging the upper third of the clivus, lateral to it is the trigeminal ganglion, the gasserian ganglion. And this is the cavernous segment lateral to the pituitary, and this is the cavernous segment, and this is the posterior loop, and this is the anterior loop, and after that, when it pierces, immediately after piercing the distal ring, give the ophthalmic, intracranial. And if you remove the clivus, you will find the basilar artery, with due, of course, to the basilar plexus, you find the basilar artery and the uh, pons. Very important. This is a global view. <clears throat> Again, the lateral segment above the foramen lateral. Lateral to it is the gasserian ganglion. Here is the vidya nerve. Below the vidya nerve, the carotid is away from the clivus. Above it is lateral to the clivus. Then the paraclival carotid form the cavernous carotid having the medial loop convex posteriorly, horizontal segment, and <coughs> the <coughs> anterior loop convex anteriorly. And this is the start of the proximal ring, and this is the distal ring. Carotid artery and optic nerve from above. We are going to revise this, as we said. This is the view. The, the Anterior clinoid process, medial to it, is the optic foramen. Medial to it is the clinoidal carotid artery. So it is a, a thick bone. There is a 
foramen inside this bone, which is the optic foramen, and there is a carotid medial to this bone, which is the crinoidal carotid. And of course, if you go from above, you see the planus phenoidal. Here it is called the sulcus chiasmaticus, not the prominent chiasmaticus. And here we have the tuberculum cellae, not the sulcus, tuberculum sulcus, tuberculum cellae. And here is the middle crinoid, floor of the cell, a dorsum cell. This is a view uh, uh, from the left side. This is the left optic nerve from above. This is the left carotid below and lateral to it. And this is the anterior clinoid process. This is the oculomotor nerve in the superior orbital fissure. And this is to show you, as we said, the carotid and the optic nerve are medial to the anterior clinoid. If you remove the anterior clinoid, you, get, you remove the lateral wall of the optic canal and you remove the lateral wall of the uh, clinoidal carotid artery. So, from below you find the lateral optic carotid recess, and we said that lateral optic carotid recess is showing the optic nerve and the carotid, which is a cavity inside the anterior clinoid. From above again, we remove the anterior clinoid, and we see here the proximal ring, which is formed from the medial wall, uh, medial layer of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, a thin layer and distal ring, which is formed of, from the uh, outer layer of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. And between the two rings, this part is called the crinoidal carotid artery. It is an extracranial carotid. Here it is inside the cavernous sinus, pierces the proximal ring, comes extracranial, medial to the anterior clinoid, which is totally removed, and we have here the optic canal, and then it pierces the distal ring, entering again intracranial. So it was inside the cavernous sinus, went outside the cavernous sinus, and got back inside the, well, sorry, it's inside the cavernous sinus, went outside the dura, outside the cranial cavity, and then passed intracranial. Cavernous carotid, third nerve, V1, proximal ring from the medial wall of the lateral, from the medial layer of the lateral wall, distal ring from the lateral layer of the lateral wall, between the two rings, anterior clinoid process, medial to it, the optic nerve, and the carotid. Again, more detailed view. Here, the, here we reached the lateral optic carotid recess because you removed the bone totally and you you enter here, you enter the sphenoid sinus. And this is the clinoidal carotid. Uh, let's play a game, a very simple game, mirror image. We'll see the thing from one side and from the other side. So again, very easy, right side, optic nerve cut, and displaced anteriorly, the ophthalmic below it, cavernous sinus here, and we removed the anterior clinoid process, and you find that the medial to the anterior clinoid is the optic nerve and the carotid artery. And if you enter this space, you find the sphenoid sinus. If you remember the carotid artery, we talked about before, we get the petrous carotid artery forming the posterior loop, then lateral loop, which is uh, medial to the gasserian ganglion, transseminal ganglion, and it passes upwards anteriorly. This is the lateral segment. This is the paraclival segment. Then we do the cavernous segment, and then the anterior loop, convex anteriorly, then it enters intracranial. So, if you remember, this is the course of the internal carotid artery. Our concern now is about this piece, which is the paraclival. This piece, 
which is lateral to the cella from below, and this piece, medial to the obturated recess, medial to the anterior crinoid, which is the crinoidal artery, and of course the intracranial, we don't see it. Again, view coming from lateral to medial, you know, the lateral segment coming from lateral to medial. Then here, lateral view forming the uh, medial loop, which is convex posteriorly. Remember when I told you that the medial loop is convex posteriorly, but I'm seeing it from anterior. I'm looking from here. So it is convex posteriorly. Then the horizontal segment, then the anterior loop, which is convex anteriorly. And here's the anterior crinoid removed proximal and distal rings. And if you look from below, again, this is the view, the paraclival segment coming from lateral to medial, then passing into the cavernous segment, forming the, here is uh, the posterior loop here, here is the lateral loop, and then the paraclival segment, and then you get the medial loop convex posteriorly, horizontal segment and anterior loop convex anteriorly. And you pierce, this is the distal ring, this is the proximal ring, and this is the optic carotid recess, and this is the clinoidal carotid, this is the cella turcic. <clears throat> Again, and this is to show you that always the video nerve should be here, above it is hugging, and the paraclival carotid, we have lateral to it immediately the gasserian ganglion, and we have here the V2 on its way to the floor of the orbit, and the V1 passing inside with the cavernous sinus and going to the superior orbital fissure. Superior orbital fissure is here. You find laterally the floor of the orbit, and lateral to the gasserian ganglion, you find the middle fossa. The extended endoscopic transphenoidal approach, we have the transplanum, very easy. We remove the planum to reach supracellular region, like what? The Bertram cell meningioma and craniopharyngioma. We go transclival. Uh, I wanted to say anything outside the cella is an extended approach. If you extend anteriorly, you go through the planum, it is an extended anterior approach. If you extend posteriorly, transclival, you remove chordomas. So it is extended posterior approach. If you go laterally to the cella, you go transcavernous to remove invasive adenomas from the cavernous sinus, or sometimes some tumors in the cavernous sinus, like cavernomas, can be removed from below. And if you go <coughs> lateral and posterior, you get lateral to the clivus, you will get the gasserian ganglion, as we said, and the infratemporal fossa. So, by the extension of the transphenoidal classic approach, we can reach supracellular regions, clival regions, cavernous regions, and the middle fossa and infratemporal fossa and gasserian ganglion. What we call extended endoscopic transphenoidal. Transplanum is very easy. Here is the floor of the cella. You go for don't go to the sulcus prominence. In front of it, you, took, you take the planum sphenoidal and you go to open the dura here. And if you open the dura, you can reach supracellar. Here is the cell. You are precellar and supracellar. You can reach the tumor. Here is the pituitary gland. This is the classic. Here, extended transplanum. You find the optica as you find the tumor, you find the arachnoid, and you remove the tumor. This is the picture after removing the tumor. You remember, this is the chiasma, and this is the superior physical artery coming from lateral to medial. And above the chiasma from below, you can see the A1 segment of one side, the A1 segment of the other side, and the A2 segments. And of course, here you see the pituitary stroke and internal carotid. So you are in front of the pituitary gland. Pituitary gland is here. You remove the bone in front of the pituitary gland in the planum. You open the bone, <coughs> you leave the gland in place, you will find the optic hasp, 
<coughs> and you'll find the tumor. And if you remove the tumor, you'll find this picture. If you remove the tuberculum cellular meningioma, you will end by finding optic nerve, optic as, pituitary stroke, carotids from either side, the anterior cerebral above the optic nerve, A1, A1, and A2. And sometimes in cases of craniopharyngioma, one of our surgeries, you reach the roof of the third ventricle. So this is the roof of the third ventricle, choroid plexus in the roof of the third ventricle, and this is the foramen of Monroe. How can we reach it? This is another story. We can talk about it in another lecture. Transclival going posteriorly, as we said, you will find what is posterior to the clivus, you can reach the, the basilar, you can reach the posterior cerebral, you can reach the uh, superior cerebellar, you can reach the ICA. So uh, you can go, you leave the cella and you go below the cella in the clivus and you reach the tumor and you can remove it. But here, always remember, don't go uh, far lateral to the upper third of the clivus above the median canal not to injure the carotid and the transcavernous you do it in case of pituitary adenomas you find that the very thin layer of endosteum separating the pituitary gland from the cavernous sinus so sometimes the tumor comes extends from the pituitary to the cavernous and invade the cavernous sinus what is medial to the carotid what is inferior to the carotid you can remove it from the cavernous sinus, whether from the floor or the medial wall. We'll talk about it in detail in cases of surgery of the pituitary adenoma. But here you know that you can go transcavernous from below. And the transterigoid. Transterigoid, as we said, <coughs> uh, these are the pterygoid processes. And you go lateral to the paraclival carotid. And you go to the gasserian ganglion and you go to the lateral cavernous sinus. So what is lateral to the paraclival carotid is the gasserian ganglion. What is lateral to the cavernous carotid is the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus going to the superior orbital fissure and the orbit. So if you go <coughs> midline, planum, clivus. Laterally, Laterally, uh, if you want to go lateral to the cella, you get the cavernous sinus and carotid. If you go lateral to the clivus, you get the paraclival carotid. If you go lateral to the paraclival carotid by removing the pterygoid bones, you can reach the gasserian ganglion, you can remove tumor from the gasserian ganglion and from the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. As you see here, the, this is the cavernous carotid artery. This is the clinoidal carotid artery. And this is the sixth nerve, is always in the cavity of the cavernous sinus, lateral to the carotid, and the V1, and the third and fourth are in the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, and the V2 is in the floor of the cavernous sinus, going infraorbital. So this is the extended transphenoidal transterigoid approach. You can reach all the region here, even the middle fossa. Of course, you can use the lens 30 degrees. And another view showing the pituitary gland, showing the cavernous carotid, the paraclival carotid, the Meckel's cave and terminal region, and the foramen rotundum in the middle fossa. And here is the clivus. Thank you very much for your attention. I know it was a, a very difficult topic, but uh, I intended to talk about all the details about this region, to unveil all the secrets of this region, and I hope I succeeded in doing this. I would be very much appreciate if you give me, give me your feedback on your comments it, was it nice or you need more details or that was part was vague i can re-explain it again and thank you again and see you soon in the anatomy of the infratemporal fossa